Thanks very much. Ah, well, I've got two giant chairs. I don't know if I'll be using those. Um, I must say, uh, my talk after the, the video we've just walking, uh, been watching feels like a bit of a, a culture shock to me. Um, but I'm told de design for music is one of the sub-themes of the conference, and it, you know, it's come up throughout the, the, the days, especially in the breakout sessions. So hopefully this, this makes some sense. And if you were here uh, yesterday and you saw the conversation uh, with Peter Saville, um, this is very much a continuation of that um, part two, but without Peter Saville this time. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to address is, uh, I've got a long title there, Think of Your Ears as Eyes. Some, um, some of you might have heard that before. It supposedly came from Gertrude Stein, the writer. I've been trying to pin that down. I can't find out where she said it, but it's a beautiful image. Um, and then, then the subtitle, which is really my, my key theme here, is this idea of um, the so-called uh, auditory image. The, and what I'm saying is the enduring power of it. So, what is an auditory image? Um, I found this great definition on Wikipedia, and what it's referring to, of course, as it says, is the idea of the mental image. So, um, in the absence of music, when you think about music, what images do you get in your head? And it occurred to me that this idea of the auditory image is absolutely perfect as a description of what we see on the album cover. And as we know, the album cover has been the primary frame for musical imagery. Um, but in fact, these images have an enormous influence on the way that we perceive bands themselves. And as, as we saw talking to um, Peter Saville, the relationship between the image you see on the cover and the recorded sound um, can be really complex and interesting. I mean, sometimes you feel almost the image is in a kind of opposition to the sound, but nevertheless, it establishes a kind of set of reference points that you then bring to the musical experience. Now, I, I thought um, Peter slightly played that down yesterday because my experience as a, a viewer and listener has been that the imagery is absolutely key to getting a sense of how to place uh, a band, a group. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what the organizers advise in the notes they give us. They say, talk about your, your personal experience, come back to your story. Uh, and the fact is, the only reason probably that I'm in design at all as a field, that I've, I've chosen to write about it, that I've stuck with it, is actually because of music, that I came to design through music. My first experiences um, were of design, design for music. And in some ways, you know, when I look at, at these examples, they still seem to me some of the most powerful images that design has produced um, in this the sort of general communication sphere. The other thing I think I want to say just, just very quickly before getting going with the images themselves is that, um, especially in the context of this conference, um, its, its main theme um, the re and also the sub-theme of uh, design for the refugee crisis, um, there is a sense, I think, for us often as, as people in design that there is something a bit trivial about a lot of design, that it just deals in images or in making an image, that there's something insubstantial about that, um, that there's something not very important. Maybe at the end, if I can do this within the time, I'm going to come back to something called um, Mas Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, where um, if if you know this pyramid, at the bottom there are basic needs uh, to do with uh, well, our need for food, our need for shelter, then our need to um, find uh, a, a mate, to have children, to have relationships, all these kind of phys physiological needs, then leading to uh, psychological needs. Um, at the top of the psychological needs would be self-esteem, and then at the very top of the pyramid is the idea of self-actualization. And the reason I think we've had so much talk about aesthetics in design for so many years is because we in the West are wealthy, comfortable, leading happy lives for the most part. We are in the position where we can pay attention to so-called self-actualization, which is a, in another way of saying self-fulfillment, um, thinking about who you are, finding who, who you are as a person. So the, the design for music, I would say, fits into that top sphere. 
So uh, just a bit about my background, my way in, as I was saying. I'm, gonna, I'm calling this the shock of the image because that's what it was. This is very early image. I saw at the age of 14, I guess it was 1971, something like that. You may know this album cover. It's a famous one by the Pink Floyd. And this is all it shows, um, the backside of a cow. That's it. Um, complete, you know, to my young mind, a complete shock. I didn't know what to make of this. There's no band name, there's no information on the cover at all. There's just this image of the cow, and you're supposed to place this image in relation to what is, in fact, experimental progressive rock music. So this gap opens up between image and sound. I only found out much later that the title, Atom Heart Mother, which plays so strangely against the cow, came from a news story um, about the first woman in Britain who got a pacemaker um, powered by uh, plutonium in her heart. So she was an Atom Heart Mother. So suddenly it has a kind of basis in um, news reporting, in, in you know, fact, as it were. But I just took it um, in terms of the, the sort of surrealism of the language. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about surrealism realism because I was looking at that a lot at that age and I understood a lot of these strange references and images in those terms. Um, I came to like the disconnections, I came to like the irrationality, I came to like the huge gap between title, image and musical experience. Then around the same time I saw this, which in a way is even more shocking. Um, Weasels Rip My Flesh. Again, this is a, almost a, a classic cover. Um, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. Um, I, pick, I picked up on it even at that age because I could see the surrealism. I understood the reference to pop art. I got the reference to the vernacular popular culture. Of course, I didn't have the terms to say these things back then, but I understood where it was coming from. And this too, you know, we, we might as well look at this briefly, has sources. It's from a men's uh, magazine of the 1950s called Man's Life. It's bizarre, this, this cover, weasels literally ripping the guy's flesh. Um, and uh, if you see these magazines, they were obsessed with animals. You know, one, one week it was squirrels ripping someone's uh, flesh or piranhas. These guys had some kind of serious problem with the animal kingdom. And then you see the shaving ad. So the, the artist has very cleverly fused all these sources in an image. But the image itself stands on its own. I mean, it doesn't come with these ref any references. You have to work out what it means. Same time, um, uh, this is really obscure now, an experimental British rock band with sort of political um, background, they were Marxists and so on, called Henry Cow. And they, they had a series of albums where you just saw a knitted sock on the cover. I'm told that it's made out of paint, but when I look at it, it looks like plastic to me, I don't know how they would have done it. But you know, it's almost a Dadaistic image, and when you compare that to the absolute intricate complexity of the sound world that they create as a band, again, you've got this um, extraordinary gap to think about. This, this is a moment when I, I think I really start to, for the first time in 1977, to think about graphic design or typography. Um, it was an issue about the so-called new music, which came to be called post-punk. A lot of it was electronic in origin. You recognize craft work here on the cover. Um, and what fascinated me was the structure of the page. These elaborate um, box rules, the use of the caps, which are spaced out like that. I was picking up on typography as the medium of a kind of expressive language which said something about the music itself. Here's a couple more pages about Eno and a band charmingly named Throbbing Gristle. Here we have a Peter Saville, because this, this whole period through the 70s, I was absolutely um, immersed in the music scene, obsessed with rock music and the idea of rock experimentation. And then come 79, we have the release of this uh, album called Unknown Pleasures. Uh, by Joy Division. We didn't show it yesterday, but Peter Saville referred to it. Um, uh, perhaps his first uh, extraordinary design. No time to go into detail there, but you probably know it anyway. But no, again, nothing on the cover apart from this, these, um, this pulsar from the stars, this strange waveform pattern. After all that, I was so, so into this that I decided to do a book about Brian Eno, who I mentioned just now. Um, he'd done an extraordinary project where he interpreted songs by Brian Eno, so you see an album cover and one of the images that relates to a song there. 
Here's another example, St. Elmo's Fire, if you know the album, Another Green World. Uh, Eno was an extraordinary thinker about the subjects. I just got absolutely immersed in, in that for a while there. And eventually got the chance, um, by degrees, to do a book about it, which appeared in 1986. And it's the first book I ever published, um, and it's a, 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 a strange hybrid. It's partly a music book, it's partly an art book, it's partly a design book, because it has this interesting design uh, by Malcolm Garrett, where no one knew where to put it in the shops. It was completely kind of outside category, and it gathers together about 50 or so images by Mills and then a whole lot of reference material um, relating to Eno and how the work, his work was created, how the songs were written, how Mills then came to interpret them as part of this big project that he did at the Royal College of Art. So, you know, this is all really by way of saying that my, my background, as I said at the start, is very much... Um, in the music side of things, and that's how I find my way into design. And my first understanding of what design could do expressively or as interpretation comes from what I see it doing in the music business. Now, again, going back to something Peter said yesterday, it is a fantastically open and free area, but I don't think that means that you know somehow the images just float entirely free of the music and are almost... Um, after the fact or even irrelevant. I, that's not the case at all, as I'm going to go on and show. So here is um, a, a bit of history. We, I think we should look at some of the people, just briefly, who are, if you like, the great masters of this medium of interpreting music, different kinds of music, through imagery in the form of an album cover. You know, in the main, I'm going to just stick with the album cover because, as we know, the album cover was the perfect frame, in a way, for the musical image. Um, I'm not going to get into moving image at all. It's not that I don't think that's interesting, but I'm interested in this idea of consolidating one's understanding of a musical experience in a single image or a sequence of still images. Um, I would argue over and over again for the value of the still image. I think we forget about that at our peril, but that might be subject of another le lecture. So here we are looking at a guy called Alex Steinweiss, sitting in his studio, obviously, um, big, a big um, uh, air, airbrush kind of um, canister there, is working away at his drawing board. And this is the man who basically invents the album cover. Uh, back then, um, albums, and they were albums, uh, had uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, shellac 78 recordings in, uh, and they just had plain covers. There was nothing on the cover. So you got these discs you could play, but there was nothing on the cover at all up until 1940 to tell you what was inside or to give you a musical impression. Um, and he said it was crazy. You know, we, we, need, to, we need to promote these um, uh, albums, and he was the right guy at the right time, and that's exactly what he did. So here it is, the, so far as we know, the first ever album cover, uh, 1940. Uh, Columbia Records, rather nice the way he very um, uh, reflexively uses the disc image as a kind of um, conveyor of the notion of you know, swelling sound waves. It's, it's clever, but it's also a slightly untypical cover. These are, are more typical. Now, from now on, I'm just going to... Um, be fairly quick fire. I've divided these into um, cat categories, so I'm referring to him as a kind of uh, an example of semi abstract stylization. Here's a, a couple by him Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Well, you see how the, the image is being reduced and stylized, obviously. Uh, and here, you know, th there's musical reference, there's a piano, there's the giant hands and so on. Um, but if you look at the composition itself, there's a feeling of this sort of semi-abstract musical space. There's a feeling of flowing sound in the imagery. Um, you, if you don't know his work, I'd recommend it. Finally, he was published in an enormous and expensive Tashin book, which you can see it's the size of one of the old albums. And this, you know, I, I don't throw the word around lightly. I think this man was a genius of musical interpretation. Another example. Um, 
which I'm calling uh, expressive realism. And this, in, in a way, realism, it's much more literal. Perhaps you know of this, this man, uh, David Stone Martin, another American, also working in the 40s. So, uh, I mean, you do, it doesn't really need any explanation. On this Art Tatum album, we see the keyboards, and there again, there is this sense of just you know, swelling sound coming out of the image. So, Stone Martin, would, he, would paint, he would paint the the players, the composers, he would show the instruments, but again, you know, he, 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 he did this in a very loose way, it's not a, a photorealistic way. Um, he would create a sense of the individual, of the culture, as in, the, in this cover here. Did ma magazine covers for Downbeat. Reed Miles, probably more familiar to you, I'm calling this um, typographic notation. Uh, again, you know, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? How musical form is finding its graphic equivalents. You know, this is astonishingly brave and experimental design work, and we might also add um, uh, that the way in which photography is incorporated like a typographic element within the graphic image uh, is pretty breathtaking. I mean, to, you know, to this day, you don't see people using photographs with this kind of fluidity and freedom very often. I don't know why that is. Another example, you know, these are all famous um, jazz, jazz players, um, alto sax player, player um, uh, Jackie McLean here, Let Freedom Ring, same treatment of the photograph, but again, you feel that the, the sound world is now embodied by the typographic treatment. That's all, even more the case with this one, a really beautiful example with the slicing and shifting of the type. It's just, it's superbly done, and there is a real feeling of music playing in the image itself. Another category, rate, relating back to where I started, surrealism and fantasy, a fairly obvious way um, of interpreting the musical image, although there are so many ways you can, you can follow that up. So we were looking at Hypnosis earlier, who did the Cow, um, Atom Heart Mother cover. This is a, a less well-known one from 1970, you know, this sort of photo montage, surrealism. Um, more familiar might be this album, Presence by Led Zeppelin, with this extraordinary um, sculpture in the center of the image, which is actually just a void in the image. It's a, a shape with black just showing through, representing um, the monolithic, dense quality of the sound itself. You know, and here we see a bunch of um, happy admirers, in a sense, contemplating the sonic essence of Led Zeppelin. I, I could probably go on all day with these uh, categories. I think I've got six altogether, just uh, uh, as examples of the way you can, you know, the huge variety of ways that you can interpret um, musical experience. So this one I'm calling atmospheric texture, and my example here is Vaughan Oliver, who worked with various photographers um, uh, uh, in, in collaboration to produce these extraordinary images. So, so here, the sound world of the Cocteau Twins, who you may or may not know, but it's, it's very floaty and ethereal. Here it's evoked by this feeling of, um, well, is it liquid? Is it a ga gaseous form? You know, we're floating, again, through this, as I say, very ethereal sonic world, um, but with, with this nice sense of a kind of, you know, like a film cut with the two different types of imagery, hot and cold side by side. Um, another example, more literal, but, you know, with the... the um, the woman in the image becoming a kind of music dreamer and uh, space itself seems to be dissolving atmospherically around her. Surrealism again was an influence here and I should say although I'm dividing things into categories of course um, a particular cover might exhibit several different styles in one, you know hybrids are always possible. Um, here we have this monkey surrounded by a kind of grid which links all the track titles uh, for the American band The Pixies. Now I think this is my uh, final ca category um, which I'm calling collage and construction, though again, you're gonna see elements of all the other things I've been talking about, particularly, probably, uh, surrealism. And here, um, uh, I want to draw attention to a British designer called Julian House, who works um, in-house for uh, a company called Intro, 
And for that reason, maybe um, House has never become quite as famous he, as he, he should be. I mean, I, would, uh, I think he's quite a shy guy, but I would like to see him here on a stage like this, you know, being interviewed as Peter Saville was, because I think he's an extremely clever and original graphic designer who absolutely gets the music that he has to interpret, who has a fantastic historical sense. You know, he knows his art history, his photographic history, uh, he knows the history of album cover design, and so, like a lot of designers, he's able to choose carefully what he wants to piece together, to, to construct a collage out of different reference points, which then, you know, in the way of collage, becomes a new idea. This is the extraordinary power of collage, you know, possibly the art form of the 20th century. We see it you know, across media, the collage aesthetic. We might call it mashup now, but it's the same idea that you take these different um, shards of, of, of reality um, from different places, they can contradict each other, you bring them together to make a new graphic idea, a new proposition, um, to embody a brand new sensibility, a way of understanding the world. Really, the, the sophistication of collage as a, a, a technique, well done, when it's, when it's well done, is almost infinite. So here's a band called Primal Scream. Um, I think this, this predates texting. Uh, interestingly, the, the, t the title has been kind of sliced up in this interesting way, condensed, exterminator is the title, and you see how it's come down. Um, all the vowels have been taken out. And the, the cover itself, I suppose, references, say, a pop artist uh, in Britain like um, Richard Hamilton with this interest in um, imagery from the military industrial complex, but then um, put together in a very broken way, almost allowing the tools, the software tools, to malfunction, to fail, to get this kind of abrasive effect. So, you know, a really sophisticated collagist. This one has got kind of Central European, East European, Polish influences for a band called Broadcast, still Julian House we're looking at there. Uh, and House then launched, uh, it's probably about a decade ago now, his own record label called Ghost Box. And again, you know, this, is, this could be the subject of a, another lecture. Uh, the idea um, of, of something called hauntology became very popular. Um, they would go, these um, musicians and visual artists like House would go back into um, British popular and cultural history. They liked the 70s in particular, and 70s um, TV they absolutely loved. A lot of those programs had weird soundtracks by the Radiophonic Workshop at the BBC, sort of strange, futuristic, but a, a little bit plinky, um, and maybe slightly, slightly twee or sentimental, but strangely uncanny music. This inspired a whole genre of music on Ghostbox and cover images that match it, that refer to the those times. Okay, so this, this is my conclusion now. Um, what, what design can still do? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I readily admit um, that in a way this is a statement of the absolute obvious because it's not like the conditions in which design operates um, here in Amsterdam or in London or, in, or New York or any, any kind of hyper-developed economy, it's not like the conditions change so much. I mean, we like to think we're, you know, we're constantly in a radical new moment where we can somehow abandon or forget what we already knew because it's irrelevant. But I'm saying, I'm, you know, I'm insisting throughout this entire talk that um, this, the musical image the single image on occasion to represent music is still incredibly powerful. I don't think um, we're, that is over. I don't think it's run its course. Look at the revival um, in vinyl. The, even the, the larger frame has come back because people like, you know, it's a specialized audience, but still, people like the covers. So just to wrap up, um, uh, here's some, some very contemporary examples which are every bit as powerful as the things I was showing earlier. There probably isn't time to explain them at great length, but here's rave tapes um, by, uh, by Mogwai. I'd be surprised if the designer who did this didn't know of the Zappa Frank Zappa cover I showed at the start. It's absolutely in the same vein, a visual shock, you know, sort of cheesy, trashy popular culture. Um, 
some of these more abstract images, or it can be astonishingly expressive. Um, this is inspired by the physical fo fo um, phenomenon called uh, vortex shedding. And then, um, in the nick of time, because I'm being absolutely disciplined here, uh, we get to my final image. You immediately get the Sar Sergeant Pepper reference in this cover. And, but isn't this absolutely, quintessentially, a contemporary image? You know, it has all the complexity we might expect, but at the same time, it has the sort of visceral power that we've seen in the early work. Um, you could look at it endlessly. It is so complex, the range of reference the way in which the artist has constructed this in the studio, just like they did Sergeant Pepper, is really breathtaking. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you.